So whenever you're ready. Sorry, I just had to get my passport stamped in flavor country. <laughs> <laughs> Tony Mike watched the world burn. This episode, we're going to be reviewing The Color of Money. What a good movie this movie is. I love this movie. I'm glad we did this. I forgot how good this movie is. And when I watched it, I was like, you know what? I haven't seen uh, The Hustler since high school, which is the prequel to The Color of Money. And I watched it. I was like, damn. I forgot how good that movie was, too. <laughs> so, anyways, Color Money was uh, released in uh, October of 1986, uh, directed by Martin Scorsese, who I forgot even directed. I actually completely forgot that Martin Scorsese directed this. I was just kind of like, oh, okay. So so that kind of, like, you know, turned my radar on for, for certain things. But we'll, we'll get into that. I'll let, you, I'll let you go through the cast and everything yeah. first. It, it, and once you realize it, you, you can see all the tropes of Martin Scorsese yes. kept through it. Not that's a bad thing, it's a great thing. Uh, screenplay by Richard Price, uh, which was based on the novel by Walter Tevis. Uh, the film uh, was done on a budget of $13.8 million and brought in a box office of $52.2 million. So it looked good. Yeah, solid moneymaker. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, cast? Uh, starts off with the late great Paul Newman as uh, Fast Eddie Felsen. Who uh, makes really great salsa? <laughs> yes. <laughs> salsa, uh, salad dressing, uh, popcorn. I mean, every, just about everything. <laughs> All salad, man. Paul's yeah, good. Yeah. Paul's All good, good stuff. Yeah. And the profits go to charity. That's, that's true. And, well... Uh, they do go to charity, but then on top of all that, he was also a race car driver, uh -huh. and he had several charities and several businesses. Yeah. Paul was actually a pretty, pretty, pretty all right guy. Yeah, we'll he was, the he was a pretty, pretty sound human being. But but we'll we'll, we'll get to that. Go ahead, go ahead. I'm yeah. sorry. No I'm just gonna sit here and drink my non-sponsored coffee. <laughs> <laughs> do you want to give a shout out to a certain company? Hayes, <laughs> you know. I would like to say we're still looking for sponsors. <laughs> so, <laughs> anyways, uh, Tom Cruise as Vince, um, who becomes uh, Paul Newman's protege for a very brief period of time. Uh, Mary Elizabeth Mastrantino as Mast Carmen, who is a, what is it? Master Antonio. Mastrantonio. Yes. Yeah, so, yeah. It's a tough one. I'm, I'm Italian. I still can't pronounce it right. <laughs> so, as Carmen, uh, Vince's girlfriend, uh, Helen Shaver as Janelle, who is uh, Paul Newman's girlfriend, uh, John Totoro as Julian, uh, who is a uh, local pull shark. Uh, there's a couple cameos in there, too. Yeah, uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Iggy Pop. Did you notice Iggy Pop in there? I did notice Iggy Pop in there. I did. Yeah. Oh. Never noticed it the first time. But then again, probably at the time I watched it, I probably didn't know what Iggy Pop was either. So there's that. And then uh, Forrest Whitaker as uh, Amos. It was nominated for quite a few awards. Um, so we have uh, Paul Newman as uh, Best Actor, which he won. Uh, right. Finally, that was his actually his, the fifth time that he had been nominated for an Academy Award for Best uh, Actor, and this is finally the role that won. And and there's some controversy around this one, and I think a lot of people feel that he was kind of given this Academy Award because he has this great body of work, and he was 61 when he made this film, so it's not like he had you know, uh, a bunch more films in him, and they kind of knew it. And so, yeah, I, like I said, there's there's a lot of reading to do in regards to his Academy Award on this one. I don't know what all it was up against, but Paul Newman most definitely turned in a really solid performance here. So oh, I don't have a problem with it. But but anyway, go ahead. I don't have a problem with it either. I mean, being nominated, uh, I think it was close to, like, I think it was either sixth or seventh, actually. 
Uh, but either way, he's been nominated like multiple, multiple times. Yeah. And yeah, I, I think it's well deserved. I think he acted greatness. Like you said, I don't know what else it was up against in '86. Probably some good stuff, but I can't think of anything in '86 that really jumps out at me at the moment. Um, I'm, I, you know what? I'd actually have to go and and look that one. You know what? You 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 talk. I'm gonna, I'm gonna. I'm gonna look that one. I'm gonna see what the the 1986 Academy Award nominees are for uh, what what Paul Newman was up against. Yeah, I'll um, wait. All right. Maybe we'll oh, we go. Oh, it was it was uh, Paul Newman for The Color of Money. Okay. Uh, Dexter Gordon from Round Midnight. Uh, Bob Hoskins for Mona Lisa. Uh, William okay. Hurt for Children of a Lesser God and yeah. Jake Woods for Salvador. Never seen, <laughs> never seen any of those. Really? Nor have I heard of half of them. Really? Really. I don't, really get, I don't really get into the Academy Awards or the Oscars and all that bullshit. Because um, most of those movies, you know, when I was younger, I was too young to really appreciate them. And now I'm at an age where maybe they'll appeal to me. But it's been so long that, you know, it's fucking 30-something years ago. Well, yeah, but but just to put this into perspective for you, that same year, for Best Supporting Actor, for Best Actor in a Supporting Role, okay. uh, it was Michael Caine for Hannah and Her Sisters, Tom Berenger for Platoon, Platoon. William okay. Defoe for Platoon. There you go. Denholm Elliott for A Room with a View, and Dennis Hopper for Hoosiers. Hoosiers is a good movie. See now, so I'm just saying, like, like that year, the best supporting actor was a far more competitive one. So while some people might actually say that you know Paul Newman was given the Academy Award, I'm going to say that there was not a real strong field here because I love Bob Hoskins, and I can't tell you that Mona Lisa was like his big standout role. He's done so much great work. Yeah, um, I, he was I, the guy that, that was in the. Uh, um... Who framed Roger Rabbit, right? He's the, yeah, that's, the okay, that's what I thought. Yeah, he was also in uh, The Cotton Club, um, which I really enjoyed him really in that. Um, Bob Hoskins has been in so much stuff. It's it's kind of like he's the epitome of a British actor who just kind of like Michael Caine. He just you send him a script and a check and he'll show up and he's <laughs> gonna be in the movie. and he doesn't care if it's good or bad or what. Bob Hoskins is just there to do the work. And I can <laughs> see a whole lot. He's, he's, he's Winston Zeddemore. If there's a steady paycheck in it, I'll do whatever you want. <laughs> it's, like, it's funny because Sean Connery is kind of the same way. Sean Connery has some epic, remember, you know, memorable roles, um, big, you know, iconic roles, and but Sean Connery's been in some god awful movies. I mean, like, like, like no vision, no nothing. Like he was very obviously a. Pay by the, as a matter of fact, by the time he got uh, to do Highlander, he was slumming it pretty much at yeah, that point. Was. He knew that he was slumming it at that point because Highlander was a go nowhere, do nothing kind of movie. So, you know, and I just find it funny that there are actors out there that, that they're happy to do that kind of work. But then, you know, the flip side is, is that you wind up with, you know, these, these you know, actors in America that their career gets destroyed because they took like a bad role and it's like who gives a shit so I, I've never understood that perspective um, but it's it's very much it's very real it's very there I, I guess it all depends on what kind of actor you are yeah well look at John Travolta he's his uh, career has been roller coaster from day one you know, oh, start, sure. you know start off with good hits and then he had like a like the, his first four films were like all mega successful like Grease, Urban Cowboy, Saturday Night uh, Fever. Um, yeah, Saturday Night Fever. I don't know, what was the fourth one? I can't think. But like uh, all, all four were really successful, and then started dance crazes. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah, there's that. <laughs> or, or took place in time, you know, when those things were going on. Because like, when, you you know, you mentioned it actually yourself several times that fucking during the early '80s, there was a whole Urban Cowboy thing where everybody had their cowboy hats and shit, kicks oh, yeah. and boots. Yeah. 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 Yep. Everywhere. Summer cowboy is more like it, but you know, anyway. <laughs> yes. Um but yeah, no, then John Travolta had like a bunch of duds in a row, and then he did what was it? Look who's talking. Yes. And, and that was his vehicle back to to comeback status on that one. 
And um, then it dove again. And then he did Pulp Fiction. And then it dove again. And he had... Oh, there's another one. There, he had a couple of good films after that. I just can't think of what they were off the top of my head. Um, it was not Face God. Off. I love Face Off. Face Off was a fantastic <laughs> movie. It's, it's got it's got two of the like the best worst actors ever, you know, John Travolta and Nicolas Cage, who does I great just, movies and does shit movies, you know. Nicolas Cage is the only real working actor I can think of that's that's truly an American actor, um, because again, he'll he'll take any script, he don't care. But yeah. how he got in that situation is kind of fascinating because you know this is he won the Academy Award for leaving Las Vegas and and he was a very serious heavy dramatic actor but then he would also like run off and do like Con Air and The Rock and and like like he he had range he's a very a very versatile actor and the funny thing about it is that you believe him uh -huh. in these wackadoo roles that he does so. So that has something to do with, with his, his charisma. So I'm never going to tell you that Nicolas Cage is a bad actor. I will say that he most no, definitely he amps up the crazy for some roles, but he's not a bad actor. Hey, Michael Caine so, did Jaws 4, The Revenge, and I don't see anybody giving him shit about it. So I'm just saying, if you enough. need a bad movie, I mean, there is... There is uh, the Last Shark, which is an Italian movie that's a Jaws ripoff, and it's better than Jaws 4. Just, just remember that. I mean, like, like there's Devilfish, which is a <laughs> squid and a shark crossed together, and it's better than Jaws 4. So uh, I'm just saying, and Michael Caine was in it, and they got Ellen Brody back from the first movie. So yeah. you can, and Mario Van Peebles, the peeb, is in that. <laughs> He give you the people's eyebrow. <laughs> and, wow. And so yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh shit, we're on fast list tonight. <laughs> so yeah. So also nominated uh, for best of supporting actress uh, Mary Elizabeth Mastrantonio. Um, we had uh, Richard Price nominated for Best Screenplay and uh, Best Art Direction, uh, Boris Levin and Karen O'Hara. Um, i got to ask a question. You said sure. it was nominated for Best Screenplay. Was it nominated for Best Adapted Screenplay? Or yes, best yes, it is Best Based on Other Material, yes. So okay, I, I ask that because I know that, that when they were doing pre-production on this film, um, the book is very different from the movie, and Paul Newman was very heavily involved in the writing process of this one. So it was it was him, Martin Scorsese, and the writer, and there was something along the lines of like 38 major rewrites of the movie. Oh, wow. uh, throughout, yeah, throughout its development. Um, so it was something like 38 drafts. So I, I was I was reading an interview with the actual writer and. And they, they lifted ideas from the book, but they did not, like, pick up the book. They, they changed it very, very much. So okay. um, you need a, if you're not satisfied with The Color of Money, go and read the book, and you'll discover that it's a very different book. So No, no, no. Fuck that. Fuck that. You, there is no reason why you should be disappointed in this movie. No reason you should be disappointed in this movie. I'm not saying you Even if you don't like pool, you shouldn't be disappointed in this movie because this movie really... It's nothing to do with fucking pool. It's just a vehicle for a character study. Well, you know what? Are, are we ready to go through the plot beats? Almost. I got to point out one more thing. Okay. Fuck you, Siskel and Ebert, because they gave this movie two thumbs down. <laughs> really? <laughs> they did. The only Martin Scorsese movie they ever gave two thumbs down to was this. Wow. Yeah. That's kind of fascinating, considering that... Um, I, ironically, um, Roger Ebert gave Mad Max Beyond Thunderdome four stars and said it was it was visually the most interesting movie in the genre that had been put out in a very long time. I, I, he he like literally he gushed so hard on Mad Max Beyond Thunderdome it looked like a Bukaki film at the end. <laughs> of, of, of the movie. So. Uh, <laughs> I mean, if, if, if you need to see what, what a, if you need to read a review that will let you know what a fanboy review reads like, just read Roger Ebert's review on Mad Max Beyond Thunderdome. That's, that's all I got for you. I, it's, it's, it's insane 
how much he I think like I think he bought it on VHS and put it under his pillow and like kissed it goodnight. That's how <laughs> how much he gushed on it. I mean, it was it's kind of creepy. Uh, but anyway. So yeah, uh, if you want to, yeah, we can go ahead and get into the plot. So so we're ready to get into the plot. Yeah. So so I'm fascinated by this movie because this movie has a ton of layers to it. And it is it is very much one of those you can watch it on the surface level and you can see that it's this old time pool hustler who finds this new kid and he's going to show him the ropes and it's, you know, takes him out on the road, shows him how to get his hustle on, um, shows him how to make money uh, by not just winning, but also losing and when to lose and when to win, that kind of thing. Teaches him more about betting than anything else. Um, shows him a couple well, of for, for getting people, you know, scamming people. I would say this, it's not about betting, it's reading people. And that's really the whole th main thread of this whole movie, really, is how to read and manipulate people. Yeah, well, I mean, it is the sequel to The Hustler. Yes. So, so, but, but, so, so we kick off, and there's Paul Newman, and, and he's meeting with his girlfriend, and he's hustling her. Because he is trying to sell her this knockoff whiskey, and he is telling her that he can get it for such a deal, and and that it's smooth and it tastes good, and that, that it's it's not the ingredients; it's aged in these specific barrels, and that's uh, really where the taste comes. And he's 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 talking it up. He is just biggest life, just completely overselling the crap right. out of this. He is talking about the color and the bouquet and, and all this. And 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 while that's going on, while he is trying to get his swerve on, he has his uh, little toady, Julian, um, who is playing pool, who's supposed to be trying to hustle Tom Cruise. And Tom Cruise is kicking his ass. And, and Julian keeps coming back for cash, and he's all like, I'm setting him up. I got him on the ropes. Blah, 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 blah. <laughs> And, and and just keeps kicking it and kicking it and kicking it. And, and the best part about that scene is that, you know, when they're getting ready to play a shot, Tom Cruise is more concerned with playing a video game than he is actually about playing pool. He's like, yeah, hang on a second, hang on a second. So he, he finishes his game and he goes over to play pool. pool and uh, uh, he kicks Julian's ass again. And the, the, the funniest part of the movie is is, well, I won't say it's the funniest part of the movie, but one of the great things about the movie, and really one of the big notes about Tom Cruise's performance is that, you know, it's a big money game. They're playing for 20 bucks. Big deal, you know, <laughs> at this point. But but when he, Julian says, you know, I'm busted, and Tom Cruise goes, well, we can just play for fun, and and the look on his face, the look on Julian's face, He's like the thought never occurred to him to play for fun. I love that scene. I love the structure of it. I love the build up to it. I love the way that they inform you on all these characters without, you know, having to give you any exposition. You're witnessing it happen. It is it is flawlessly done filmmaking. It's it's very much a prototype for Goodfellas. You see a lot of what is going to become the Martin Scorsese trope really developed here. Mm -hmm. um, exactly. Even this is like the music, good. you got uh, Phil Collins do One More Night, and it just works so well in that scene. Um, I'm not a Phil Collins fan, but that song, it's just a great song selection. It's just a nice, easy, because it goes with the way, you know, uh, Paul Newman is selling, selling his whiskey. You know, it's, it's, it's all romancing that fucking, that shit. You know, and then he's getting romanced by fucking Tom Cruise. He hears that fucking phrase like, damn, you hear that phrase? Like, what the fuck is going on over here? Yeah. yeah. So he's got, he sledgehammer. he's got a sledgehammer break as well. Yes, that's it. Yeah. Yeah. Where do they get the kegs? Mm. They just do. That's all. Okay, just do whatever you want to do. It's going to leave the warehouse one way or the other. Come on, on the snap, Vincent. That kid's got a sledgehammer break. So, but but like what they conclude that scene, and here's here's like one of those little details that if you're if you're not really like 100% invested in, in what's going on, one of those details that I love 
is that when Paul Newman gets up to go to walk over and talk to Vincent and and Carmen, um, yeah. uh, uh, the girl behind the bar goes, "Can you get me some wild turkey labels?" And as he's getting up to walk over, then he goes, "Yeah, yeah, sure." Yeah. So, so yeah. Um, <laughs> I definitely needed to know what kind of liquor salesman that uh, you know uh, oh, Fast Freddy yeah. Felson is. He's the scammy kind. So, oh. so yeah. But um, you know, he's moving on from one deal to another deal. Um, so he goes and. He, makes this offer to, to, you know, basically he's courting them. Yes. Oh, yeah. uh, and he talks about basically being their stake horse, about, you know what, I'll, I'll put the money up and you play. Um, and, you know, naturally, you know, they have that, like, you know, tough street kid, like, oh, well, we know what we're doing sort of thing going on, when they really don't. Um, they're completely amateur. They, 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 he knows how to win a pool game. He knows how to place a bet, but what he doesn't know how to do is maximize his returns on what he's betting. Um, so it's 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 fascinating in that like the whole next bit, uh, he takes them to dinner to talk about things, and and you know uh, he he does this whole spiel about how you know he's he's good at reading human nature and and. And, you know, he's like, you know, that guy's been buying that girl drinks for, like, the last half an hour. He's going to get up and walk away in the next several, you know, seconds, next 30 seconds. And uh, he hands his watch to Vince. He wants to prove how good of a read on people that he has. Well, the guy gets up at, like, 35 seconds. And then he goes, you know what? Uh, I'll bet you the check that I can go over to that girl and leave with her in a minute. And, you know... Uh, they agree to that bet, and and he gets up and he walks over there and he sits down and it turns out that he knows her, and he's like, hey, come outside to my car with me, blah blah blah, and he walks over just for a moment to to drop a ten on the table and say something about you Here's know, the cab. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, but um, it, it's funny in that when it's all said and then he walks outside and he's talking to the girl that he just walked outside with from the bar, and it turns out that. He's not a really great read at human nature. He just literally knows these people, and he's using that as a setup to hustle Vince and Carmen. So it's it's nice to see that like all these scenes. If if you're ever watching it and you're like going, "Wow, Paul Newman really knows his stuff." Wow, that character he's he's a really good student in human nature. No, no, he's not. He's slimy and he's hustling these kids because he wants to manipulate them into going on the road with him. That's kind of the whole point of all those scenes. He is not a great read of, of human... He's a salesman. That's that's exactly what he is through all that stuff. So, so anyway. Um, so they agree to go on the road with him. And, and the deal that he makes is like, you know, he takes 60% of the winnings and they get 40%. And Tom Cruise's character naturally thinks, you know, well, that, that means I got to win a lot of pool. And Paul yeah. Newman's like, no, you're going to lose a lot of pool. You're going to learn how to lose, and you're going to learn how to lose correctly. Because you know what? The whole point of this excursion is if you lose three games in a row, and then you're like, oh, let's do something stupid and put a big bet on it, and maybe I can get even again, that's when you get the suckers. That's when you get them busting out their wallets, and that's how you get paid in the pool business. Uh, and that's a tough thing for Tom Cruise to do because, like you mentioned in the very first scene, he he's not in it to really to win money. He's really in it to prove that he is the best at, yes. at, at, at the game. And it, the, the money aspect of it is, is really, second, really secondary, and it takes a long time for that to sink in. As a matter of fact, it doesn't when they're together, but go ahead. Now, well, I was going to say, I mean, at the beginning of the movie, he actually... He, he works at a toy store. He's yeah. selling baby equipment yeah. um, to people. And and it's, I don't remember what the name of it was. It's very obviously a children's palace yeah. that they repurposed for, I, I want to say it's like Toy World or Kids World or something like that. But uh, I, I know what those stores looked like back in the day. Um, uh, but but yeah, so so it's it's very much, he's, he's manipulating Vince and Carmen. Oh, there's, there's a key thing that happens in that scene when he, uh, when he meets him at the toy store, he drops the thing that, you know, uh, Carmen, you're, you're going to lose her. You're, you're losing her. She's losing interest. Yeah. 
Yes. Yeah. And and again, that's it's all part of manipulation. Is that that he noticed that you know, Tom Cruise was very sensitive about you know his relationship with Carmen. Um. And and you know. It's it's played to perfection that like young and dumb love that like oh, yeah. obsessed mm -hmm. with with the person you're like you know I can't believe I'm with this person I don't know why they're with me and and Tom Cruise he's a handsome guy mm -hmm. and and he is playing it to the nines he's a complete goofball uh, but he he never comes off as phony no Even if he's doing like the most ridiculous shit when he's when he's doing the nunchuck swing with the pool cue yeah. it's like you know what. Yeah, I, I I know that dude. I've I've hung out with him. I've had yes. drinks with that guy before. <laughs> and you buy every bit of it. So you know, Tom Cruise was not nominated, and I'm sorry, he kind of should have been. Yes, he should have. <laughs> Absolutely should have. So here's the other thing too. Here's how Paul Newman even knows that uh, he can manipulate him that easy is because Carmen tells him the story. Paul Newman the story of how him and her and Tom Cruise met, and that's. Uh, she was the getaway driver for her then boyfriend who robbed uh, Vince's parents' house. And she kept the necklace that was stolen from there. Tom Cruise knows she has that necklace, and, but she, uh, she just goes, and when Vince sees it, he always went, oh, my mom has a necklace just like that. Yeah, yeah. And so, that's how Paul Newman knows that all I said, dude, just dropped the slightest of hints. So, it, well, it's, it's yeah. the slightest hint, it's, it's perfectly written. Mm -hmm. It's perfectly executed. It is. It is perfectly directed. It's not done for melodrama. It is like literally, like like you know, deep down, you know, Vince knows that's his mom's necklace, yes. but exactly. he is so caught up in love with Carmen that he's never going to accuse her of doing that sort of thing. And that's that's the kind of character moment that. It takes a really gifted screenwriter, a really gifted director, and a really gifted actor to not overdo that one. If you overdo it, it's melodrama. It comes off as cheesy and, and just, you know, oh, it's just dumb Tina. This comes off as like an honest, there's an, there's an earnestness to it. You believe it. You buy into it completely, which is kind of funny because Martin Scorsese is, is you know, basically manipulating the audience in exactly the same kind of ways that Paul Newman's performance and Tom Cruise's performance are manipulating the audience mm -hmm. into this whole thing. They're really romanticizing how great hustling is. So, <laughs> so anyway, so they go on the road, and uh, they're they're going to all the different pool venues. Um, uh, they get into high chinks and mad cat capus. And <laughs> one of my one of my favorite things. And one of my favorite parts of the movie, and this is the part of the movie that I always remember first when I start talking about the color money, is when he's playing pool with a guy that has the hole in his neck. He's got the little little curtain that covers up his trach ring where the hole is. And, and um, you know, Paul Newman's like, come on, beat this guy and, and let's get our money and let's go. And Tom Cruise is like, this guy's breaking my heart. I mean, he's got a hole in his neck. And blah. So Paul Newman, you know, sets him up to where... When the game is over with, he can't pay the guy. So that guy and all of his buddies beat the crap out of Tom Cruise. Yeah. Paul Newman uh, walks off. He walks up in the loft area of that pool hall so Tom Cruise can't find him. He's like, well, Eddie's got the money. And he's looking around. There ain't no Eddie to be found. So, and, and well, then, then he comes down and he says, I'm the kid's father. And then he slaps him around a couple <laughs> times himself, which, which is a great moment because, you know, it completely catches Tom Cruise off guard. You can tell that he, he was not expecting that one. Uh, I'm a father. You little bastard. Huh? How do I do? I tell you not to play, I tell you to play. Ah, family. But, uh, uh, I mean, again, it's their way of getting out of there without actually paying. So, so they run out of the pool hall, they, they hop in the back seat of the car, and they're driving off, and, and you know, uh, uh, they're kind of giggling about everything that happened in there. And, and then Tom Cruise is like, I'll take a fucking pool cue down that hole in that guy's throat. And, and so I, I love that, because number one, it's hilarious, but number two, it's like that, that moment that he realizes that, you know what, don't feel sorry for the people that you're playing against, because at the end of the game, if you didn't beat them, they're going to want their money. They're not going to cut you any breaks, so you shouldn't be cutting them any breaks either. And, yeah. and they repeat that theme several times, 
as the movie goes on. I mean, there's there's this old lady and and she's got like you know a, a captain's hat on and it looks like she's playing with her her you know grocery money and Tom Cruise cleans her the fuck out and that's all there <laughs> is. To it. So she's gonna be having some ramen noodles and Campbell's soup for the week. So yeah. but um, <laughs> so so they're doing like you know all of these. They're basically Paul Newman is teaching him how to hustle, but again. For, for Vincent's character, it's all about wanting to be the best. He doesn't want to go on the road and learn how to hustle. He wants to go on the road and beat everybody that's got a pool cue at yeah. a pool table. That's that's his whole thing. Um, and that's why and, Paul Newman, why, uh, that, why Eddie can relate to Vince, is because that was him 20-something years ago in The Hustler. He didn't really care about winning the money. Because when he's playing Minnesota Fast, he's up 18 grand, and this is like a 1960 whatever. So that's a shit ton of money. I mean, 18 grand now, still nothing to sneeze at. And he could stop right then. But he's like, you know what? I the game's over when Fast says the game's over, and he, he ends up losing because he just couldn't. You know, doesn't have the endurance for it. I, I you know, I mean, it, it's it's one of those just because of how they shot it and how it was written, all that stuff. There's not a relationship in there that feels phony. There's no. nothing in there that doesn't feel like they put everything on the page or on their performances that they could have. So um, I, I, I love the dynamic between all three of them because, you know, Vincent looks up to Freddie, but at the same time, Eddie. he doesn't trust Freddie because... Eddie, not Freddie. Yeah, well, it's not just that, but like like Carmen... No, you're calling him Freddie. His name's Eddie. I'm sorry. I'm so, my bad. <laughs> I'm so I, I you know it's 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 fast fast Eddie fast as Felsen. and and I know that but I keep thinking Freddie got fingered I got that movie stuck <laughs> in my fucking head and don't ask me why because uh, it happened underneath the bleachers but anyways so, <laughs> so anyway yeah but no um uh so there's a, that, this great dynamic with fast Eddie Felsen and and uh, he looks up to him and he's trying to learn from him because he gave him this really expensive pool stick and he obviously knows what he's talking about but at the same time he doesn't trust him because Carmen's kind of flirting with him and she kind of does it in front of of uh Vince on purpose and then there's like this this he's trying to teach him this this one uh hustle where Tom Cruise is in there and he's playing pool against somebody, you know, else in the bar. And uh, he walks in with um, Carmen, and and they're playing as a couple. And it, rather than Tom Cruise being the one that's actually doing the heavy betting and the play scene, Paul Newman actually makes a side bet with the bartender for like a thousand dollars about whether or not Vince is going to choke on the next shot. Well, of course he does because that's part of the setup, but they, they do make, a, they go into a lot of detail about how that actual setup and how that scam works. But when they get outside and they're divvying up the money, um, Vince freaks out because Eddie was, had his hands all over Carmen. And, and so even though they've spent all this time on the road, there's, there's that lack of trust and it's, it's programmed in. There's this, this mm -hmm. really, you know, this jealous streak in Vince. Well, it's not a jealousy streak. It's an insecurity because he drops it. Like I say, he drops that hint that she's leaving. So now he's really insecure about his, his relationship with her now. Yeah. 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 So and not only they call it jealousy, it's more insecurity. I, I, you know what? I'll agree with you. You're, you're absolutely right. That's far better phrasing than jealousy. You're right. It is most definitely an insecurity. It is, there's a lot going on here psychologically with all well, of this. Also, also, too, Carmen is trying to get under Eddie's skin, too, by looking provocative, opening the door with just her panties and her, you know, shirt or yeah. changing. And she could, you know, Paul Newman can plainly see her full frontal in the mirror. And he's like, he puts a stop to that shit fast. He's like, yeah. you know, I'm not here. You know, you're not to flirt with me. You have to do this with me. We're, we're, we're business partners. This is a business. You know, your job is to keep. That's fucking happy and and, and do that you shit. And we're feel good and I teach him how to hustle. That was yes, exactly, exactly how I think how it was phrased. But um, you know the the funny thing about it is is that uh, 
after the, the, you know going to dinner and, and uh, talking about the check and the whole bet with the girl at the bar, um, Carmen actually pegs him. She actually says, you know what, you probably know his work schedule. You probably are in here every night of the week, so you know exactly when he's going to get up and leave. And and the girl, well, you probably knew her from before, right? Yeah. And, and, you know, uh, Eddie doesn't, you know, he doesn't own any of that. Yeah, no, well, he, he doesn't confirm nor deny, which in a way pretty much confirms. Well, yeah, in a way, in a way. But, yeah. but she knows he's manipulating and how he manipulates and she's kind of giving him a dose of his own medicine back she's trying to see that you know if if i push eddie is he going to is this somebody that i can attempt to control they're both jockeying for the top spot yeah it's what it all boils down to yeah um so so anyway she doesn't win <laughs> she doesn't win i i would kind of <laughs> Disagree with you there. We'll, we'll get to that. Anyway, so so the whole point of all of this going on the road was they're supposed to be going to Atlantic City because there's going to be a uh, tournament, pool tournament, uh, in six weeks. And that's the reason why they're learning all these hustles because he tells them, you know, you can lose the tournament and go and spend time in the green room and you can make three or four times the money that the winner of the tournament made. So this is a win-win proposition for him. It's either, you know what, we can go... We can learn all this, this, these hustles and, and win the tournament, or we can go and learn all these hustles and knowing when to place a bet, know when to lose, mm -hmm. which is, is kind of shady and shitty, but there it is in a nutshell. That's kind of the whole point of all this stuff. So th there's multiple lessons that, that Paul Newman is attempting to teach him, but so, so they have a good night and, and they make some money. And, and uh, uh, Tom Cruise, like, you know, has learned to hustle. Paul Newman decides he's going to celebrate. He grabs the babushka, and he goes out. And he goes to a pool hall, and and he is winds up playing pool with Forrest Whitaker. And, you know, first several games, he is just he is just mopping the floor with, with Forrest Whitaker's uh, winning game after game after game. And he's drinking, and he's kind of like being jovial and friendly, but he's still picking up the cash. And, and then the wheel turns at a certain point. And then all of a sudden, you know, Forrest Whitaker, Amos wins. And he's like, oh, man, that was, that was bullshit. No, that, that was just pure luck. That shouldn't even count. And they, you know, double or nothing. And uh, all of a sudden, Eddie is on a big losing streak, but he can't pull out of it. He's got it stuck in his head that, damn it, he's the hustler. And, and he's going to take this guy because that's what he does. He goes out and he takes guys. And he gets destroyed game after game after game. And when it's all finally said and done, he asks him, hey, Amos, are you a hustler? And Amos says, let me ask you a question. Hey, I want to ask you something. I want you to be real honest with me. I think I need to lose some weight. And he takes his pool cue apart, sticks it in his back pocket, and then he walks out of there. You know? Um, and and all this happens in front of uh, Vince and Carmen. They walk yeah. in about halfway through this. And and they watch. And and uh, Paul Newman's completely deconstructed. The hustler got hustled. He got hustled in front of the people that he's teaching how to hustle. And he didn't just get hustled a little bit. He got he got wiped out. So he, he has a complete breakdown. And he basically tells them, I've taught you everything there is to know. And, and you know, he, he gives them money. And they part company. Well, and also, that, that, that was the final lesson, too, of, you know, losing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well... <laughs> Not just losing. I mean, I, I guess here, and this goes back to the Hustler, you know, the original movie is is that was the movie that he just didn't know when to say when. Yeah. And this is kind of like a repeat of that. It's 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 most definitely meant to echo that 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 he didn't know when to say when he knew that he was being hustled, and rather than taking his money and walking away from the table, which is what the thinking man mm -hmm. would do. He stayed in the game because he thought, no, just this once, just this once, I'll beat him this time. 
which is exactly what they want everybody they play pool against to think too. Yep. It was luck. It was this. It was that. The balls. The balls roll funny for yeah for everybody. For, for everybody. Yep. That's, that's exactly the point that they were trying to get across: is knowing when to stop. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're losing, take your loss and lose. Don't stick around and make it even worse. But the irony of it is, um, at this point, Eddie decides he's going to really bone up. He's going to grab his pool stick. He's going to go get his glasses, going to get his eyes fixed, and he's going to practice, and he's going to really lay into it. And he spends weeks practicing. Three he goes weeks. Back so it's three weeks from the time he cuts them loose. He gives them $3,000. Here's the money. I've taught you everything I know. Go, you got three weeks and 27 pool halls between here and Atlantic City. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, but <laughs> and Tom I, Cruise is pissed. He is pissed because it, essentially it's, it's like having your father, you know, just dump you off and abandoning you. Oh, you sure. Know, that's how that comes across. So it's a big blow to Tom Cruise. And Carmen's like, you know, at this point, no one really fucking needs you anymore anyway. So give me, give me the fucking money. <laughs> and, and honestly, I think Carmen's character, as written, I think she sees it as she won. She didn't win because yeah. she necessarily played the game better. She won because she outlasted him, which, again, goes back to themes in The Hustler of, you know, last man standing is last man yeah. standing. Coming yeah. in second in a last man standing contest is still a lose. So yeah. it's, it's funny how they echoed that theme, you know, without drawing too much attention to it. Yeah. So... Um, so Paul Newman starts practicing. He's, he's working on his pool shots. He's, he's doing everything he can. And he's back at, at Chalkies again. Yeah, Chalkies. And, and he decides that he's going to play the big stick in the room. And that is Moselle. And, and he plays him and, and he beats him. Mm -hmm. And, uh, at that point when he beats Moselle, apparently he decides that like, you know, that's, that's his Rocky montage. He caught the chicken, yeah. you know. Yeah. <laughs> no one ever remembers the chicken catching from Rocky too. But he's like <laughs> he catches the chicken. And he decides that's it. He is he is going to Atlantic uh, City. Atlantic City. So I'll let you pick it up from here. <laughs> so and, and after he beats most, I was like, any guys going to Atlantic City? Because he knows if anybody goes to Atlantic City, he knows that he's that good. That his odds. Uh, aren't, aren't, aren't very good. Or I should... When you're hustling, you don't want your odds to be very good. You want to be like, ranked very low so you can yeah. hustle them a thing later. Yeah. So he asked, hey, am I going to Atlantic City so nobody knows how good I am? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, the unknown is the long odds. And the yes, long odds they, is where the big money is. So, yeah. so and, and during that time, during his montage, he... Uh, Decides too that he wants to get with um, Janelle and and make things right with her. So he, he brings uh, he's telling her he's going to Atlantic City and all this stuff, and he wants her to go, but she doesn't go right away. Um, so he shows up there. Uh, he runs into Julian there, um, and Julian kind of gives him kind of gives him shit a little bit, but not really. Just kind of like you know, it's kind of like a really really like a like a friendly poke. But Paul Newman's like, you know, takes it takes it kind of seriously. He's like, you know, um, I forgot what exactly what he says. But basically, like, like, what the hell are you doing here, you know, Eddie? You know, he asked him if he's playing. I think. Hey, Eddie. What? You playing? Yeah. You got a problem with that? I don't got any problem with that. You got any problem with that? I got no problem. Makes you happy, do it. Wanted to say hello. Yeah, he has him in these plans. Like, well, yeah, I'm here to play, and he like takes big offense to it. And Julie's like, "Hey, dude, it's all right. I have a problem. Do you have a problem? No, I have a problem. You know, whatever, dude, just chill out." Well, there's there's some bad blood there, considering how Julian and and Eddie left yeah. things. There's there's a little bit of bad blood, but I really a little bit of bad blood. But I don't, I don't think he's really meant it as offensive as uh what's his face took as as, as uh, eddie took it well 
I see. I think that it was it wasn't an innocent poke. It was more one of those. Aren't you supposed to be steak horsing that Vince guy that you dumped yeah. me for? Yeah. Oh, he left you. He dumped you. So you're here playing by yourself. Well, that's kind of pathetic. I <laughs> I really do think that that's the read that you're supposed to take away from that scene. I, yeah, is, yeah, that's true. That, that's you true. know what? Yeah. You dumped me, and I would have been your guy. I would have been here, you know, listening to everything you told me, and yeah. then you went and found that guy, and hey, he dumped you. Yeah. So that's, that's how I've always read that scene. Yeah. So, so, so anyway, anyway so uh, they go to their first match. Um, uh, Tom Cruise gets his revenge against Grady, who he had to dump to really bad in, in, in the pool hall. Um, and so that, that was really cool. And it was like, oh, it's like a nightmare, isn't it? <laughs> and then Paul Newman gets this one guy. And uh, I I don't know what happens in the break. I Something must have happened. They don't, they don't show the uh, the pool table. But he's like, well, I didn't deserve that. Then at the end, when Eddie kicks his ass, like, all the way through, mm -hmm. he's like, I didn't deserve that. And, and he's like, yes, yes, she did. <laughs> Actually, that first break, he sinks the nine ball on the break. I did. I watched that over. I de I deliberately watched that over twice. You don't you don't see what actually happens. I assume that's what happened, but yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, every time that he loses, he says, "I didn't deserve that." Well, so he says it twice. He says it once there, and he says it at the at the very end of, of their of their scene together. Uh, so then uh, Eddie finds out that he's gonna be playing Vince next. Mm -hmm. uh, they. I think they had an exchange in the green room, but I don't remember how that went. Um, actually, uh, they were in the bar, and uh, Vince walks up and kind of says, you know, you were right. We were ready to go out on our own. We're yes. setting up. But then he tells him that he has a game in the green room, and he asks Eddie if he wants to put a side bet on it to get in on that action. Yeah, yeah. So uh, they have that exchange, and, and, and he says, you know, no, I'm just going to go lay down. I, I'm going to rest up for the game tomorrow. And uh, leaves it at that. And then, you know, they finally meet in the actual uh, tournament. And and I won't say that it's a tense playoff, but it's definitely a... They, they both they both are, are swinging their penises around pretty pretty well. They're both really trying to, to you know, put their A game on. And um, when it's all said and done... Tom Cruise makes a shot, and and the pool ball bounces on the pocket. It, it's one of those shots that you, you've seen it. You hate it when it happens. When you're playing pool, and you hit it, and you're like going, yeah, I got it. And you see it yeah. hit that bumper just yeah. right. Like, we always called it. I hit the titty. <laughs> so, but but yeah, that happens. And and at that point, Paul Newman wins the tournament. And he walks out of there and he's feeling like he just beat the whole world. He he feels great. He goes back to his hotel room and Janelle is there and they're like talking about celebrating and all this stuff. And then Tom Cruise, Vince and Carmen show up and they hand him an envelope, and he says, what's this? And that's when when Tom Cruise can't take it anymore. He's just like, oh, you know what? You're actually a pretty good player. I only had to dump four or five shots, but that last shot there, I shot it, and I missed the pocket, and you could hear the whole room go, oh. <laughs> He's talking about how great he was about basically throwing that game. He dumped it because the odds were better on Fast Eddie Felsen than they were on Vince. So they placed the bet on Eddie to win, and that was his cut of that money. And and it's again, it's it's wonderfully handled. It's so perfectly done. And and you watch Paul Newman be completely deflated in that scene. He goes from being on top of the world to like like can't hide from the light fast enough. It's it's a fascinating scene, and and again, it really shows how masterful Newman is at this kind of stuff. Um, and, and then when he leaves, like you know, Janelle kind of has that, like you know, yeah, he's he's kind of a scumbag. Yeah. <laughs> um, 
which which I, I appreciate that. Again, it's it's just yeah. everything about it's so like you know these people. This is the kind of stuff that's happened to you, you know. And that's that's why I, I really enjoy this movie. So anyway, um, the next day, Paul Newman has moved on in the tournament, and he gets out and he's he's got his next opponent and he's getting ready to play and he stops and he takes his pool cue apart and he says I'm forfeiting and he walks over to Tom Cruise who's sitting in the audience and he takes the envelope and stuffs it into his uh his jacket and and walks away and and it's it's just the most like big dick fuck you move that he possibly could have oh, yeah. done because Tom Cruise essentially his reputation. Oh, well, I'm sure like everybody there knows, you know, people were throwing games, people were betting for the underdog. If you think tournaments are about who wins or who gets the title, you don't understand tournaments, especially when it's a betting game like pool is. So yeah. he does that. Everybody now knows, even though no one knew who Vince was six weeks ago or two days ago. Now everybody knows exactly what kind of player Vince is. And as you can imagine, this upsets Vince and Carmen because who taught them how to do this kind of crap? Oh, well, that would be Fast Eddie. And so he goes and he meets him in the green room. And, uh, you know, basically they, they have words. They have really big words. And, and it's just kind of one of those. It's a fascinating ending, a tie-up, I guess. I don't want to call it an ending. It's a fascinating wrap-up for this movie. Because at the end of it, they completely switched places. Paul Newman wants, you know, Eddie wants Vince's best game. He doesn't give a shit about the money. He uh -huh. doesn't care about any of that. He just wants the best game. He wants everything that Vince has got. Yeah. All Vince cares about is the envelope. All right, fine. We'll play for the envelope. That's how it is. And, and you know... Eddie's like, yeah, sure, fine, whatever. You know, the envelope it is, that's fine. And then, you know, they have that that last exchange where he's like, you know, if I don't beat you now, I'm going to beat you next month. And if I don't beat you next month, I'm going to beat you two months from now. I'm back. Yeah. And and it's I, I love that ending because it's like, you know, Fast Eddie Felson, who learned how to hustle in the original movie, and it's, this movie kicks off, and he's likable, but he's scummy. He's really mm -hmm. scum. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and at the same time, you know, Vince, perfectly likable. And, and again, Tom Cruise's performance is really underappreciated because, the because at the beginning, he's a flake, he's funny, he's, he's like doing all this stupid, annoying stuff. He rides that line between being really funny and really annoying. And, but at the end of it, you know, when you see his performance in those last few scenes when they hook up again at the tournament... It's that thinly veiled scumbag. It's like, you know what, he's he's doing those same things. He's doing the same mannerisms and he's, you know, making funny jokes and ha ha ha. But then like you see like like the veneer comes off and you can actually see that he doesn't mean it now. He was, you know, that's a put on. All he really cares about is the money mm -hmm. at this point. So so again, that's kind of perfect. But then on top of all that, then you watch Mary Elizabeth Master Antonio's performance and you see that she went from being the one who lords everything over Vince, you know, does whatever she has to do to manipulate him to get him to do whatever she wants him to do. And they get to that and she's got that like beat that that you know beat puppy look about her because they make a bet with somebody and and you know she bumps the bet up to fifteen hundred and she leaves and she's feeling like she did really good and he's like that, that guy had two grand written all written over, over him. <laughs> So, like, it's like, wow, you know, everybody has changed positions yes. in, in this one at the end of it. And, and it's, it's an amazing dynamic. Yeah. There's, there's a lot of themes in this movie. There's a lot of stuff, like I said, you can watch it just on the surface. And, and you know, it's, it's very much just an A to B to C kind of film. But there's so many themes and, and so many things that, you know, Scorseseisms, for lack of a better phrase. Yeah. That, that you really start to see kind of get defined in this movie. And and so uh, one of the things that I was reading was that because this movie came in 
And they actually finished production a day ahead of schedule, and they came in $1.5 million under budget. Oh, really? Uh, yes, yes. And, and um, because of how well this film did, this is the film that proved that Martin Scorsese could make a film that appealed to general audiences. This is the reason why he got to make Goodfellas next. Oh, okay. Yeah, so... So I was, I was kind of fascinated by that one because apparently, like, you know, Martin Scorsese was always seen as kind of an art house director because he did Taxi Driver and Raging Bull. And while they're critically acclaimed, I don't think that they broke any box office records. They, they did well enough. But yeah. Color of Money was the movie that actually kind of landed Martin Scorsese as a, a real bankable director. So... I guess thank you, Paul Newman and Tom Cruise, for turning it up to eleven for this one because Goodfellas is one of my favorite movies of all time. So. Me too. It's one of the few mobster movies I actually enjoy because I really don't care for mobster stuff at all. It's, it's not my bag. Um, the performances, like you're talking about, are fucking incredible. Paul Newman. I mean, what can you say about the guy? I mean, first of all, he made his career playing this character. Um, it didn't start off with the hustler. He actually started off with the uh, cat on a hot tin roof, uh, where he, um, he's, he's kind of a drunk, he's kind of a womanizer, and that's kind of Paul Newman in just about every film. But there's no chick there. He is definitely an anti hero, like in uh, Cool Hand Luke. Oh, yeah. No chicks to be found, but he is like defiant as fuck. Um, and he does everything he can to make life. For the guards in prison, you know, just trouble and hell, and and but at the same time, he's likable because he's like raising the spirits of the people, you know, in the in the prison with them. Yeah, the whole entire time. Um, it's crazy. Uh, and Slapshot is is, is very fast, Eddie Felson. Um, you know, he's trying well, to. He definitely. knows, huh? Yeah, most he's, definitely. You know, I, I mean, yeah. that's probably the closest. Uh, approximation to this, but uh, so Paul hey. finds out that the team is gonna get sold, so he is hustling and saying that, Oh, there's interest in this uh group of buyers down in Florida, you know, we're gonna be moving down to Florida, so we need to start really playing. So he's manipulating the media, he's manipulating the, the, all the players, um, to give the play the best they can, so he they do get picked up by somebody. Uh, but there's no, there's really no deal. He's just playing it like there is a deal. The Verdict is probably the only film I can think of about Paul Newman where he's not playing fast Eddie Felsen or, or yeah. someone like him. Because in The Verdict, he is like a loser. He is an alcoholic attorney who has not had a case in a very long time. And he gets handed this case that, that they're just expecting him to fill out some paperwork and, and you know, take his cut of the settlement because the hospital is really wanting to settle and he decides that he's going to go on a moral crusade this mm -hmm. time because he feels that the doctors did something you know malpractice and this woman's life is worth more than the pittance that they're offering for this it's a it's a brilliant film and it's the only one i can think of where it really plays against type that Paul Newman is, is not necessarily likable, and he is not the lovable loser. He's just a loser in that one, and it's it's really heavy. Well, but, that's see, that's not against type. That is that is playing to the strengths of Paul Newman. Because if he's not if he's not like a if he's not like a womanizer or a drunk, he is a loser or some type of scumbag character. Cat of hot tin roof, the hustler, HUD, cool hand Luke. Color money. I don't know what nobody's fool is, but there's other movies other than this. Uh, uh, cool you is. know, The Stain, Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid, Slapshot. I mean, all these movies. I mean, that's his bread and butter is those types of characters. The, the, the scumbag, the lovable loser, or the womanizer, or sometimes all of them in one role. <laughs> so, but you know, going back, I mean, Paul Newman... Got it covered, and, and and I really do think that he did earn that Academy Award. I don't think that it was yeah. one that was handed to him because he's got a history of performance. It really is a wonderfully nuanced performance. But again, Tom Cruise, I think, got really overlooked on this one because his performance is. And this was what the year after Top Gun. 
or the same year. Same year. Yeah, like, he, had a, he had a string of movies in, in the mid in the mid '80s. I mean, just just a ton of stuff. I mean, this movie was so good, people forgave him for Cocktail. So, <laughs> oh, Cocktail is such a piece of shit. It really is. It really is. Oh. But, and it's not because of his acting, because he acted great in that movie too. It's just the movie itself sucks. <laughs> um, yeah, the, the thing I thought was was interesting is that this is also a movie that kind of set up a lot of Tom Cruise movies that came after this. Because, like, if you substitute pool for car racing. Days of Thunder yeah, wanted to be this good so bad. Yeah. It, it so wanted to have this level of depth and character drive. And it's just such a cheesy, hammy, dumb movie. If you need an approximation as to how bad this movie could have gone, Tom Cruise and Paul Newman go out to, to hustle people at pool halls, it, it could have been Days of Thunder. And, and like, like, that's a serious insult. But... Um, Tom it could have been an early proto version of uh, Fast and Furious if they drag raced. Yeah, yeah. You know, it doesn't matter if you can buy one ball or a whole rack. I live by like one rack of balls at a time. <laughs> I don't mean like that. I mean, if, if they were drag racers instead of pool, pool hustlers. <laughs> I'm going to shoot it all the way down the rail. <laughs> so, <laughs> hey, at the end of the day, it's all about family. <laughs> <laughs> But, but you know, Tom Cruise, I, I mean, I, he's, a, he's an odd guy. But, I, I, again, he's in the right role. He's, this, it's a right role for him. But at the same time, he got famous for being Jerry Maguire. He was famous for being Maverick and Top Gun. He, he's, you know, famous for being in the Mission Impossible movies. And, and... What I find well, interesting famous is for risky business. I mean, even even before then. I mean, I don't see. I don't think Tom Cruise really has too many limits in roles. He he's got enough range where he could do just about anything. Yes. He, I mean, he could he could do comedy. He could do drama. I mean, you, in, in, in a lot of his movies, you'll get all that in one role. Like in this movie, he's. Fucking hilarious as best, yes. you know. He's doing the like you said, the nunchuck swing with the pull cue, and I mean, hamming it up. You know, it's like the hair is perfect. He does oh, the hand with yeah. you know, yes. wear was <laughs> I mean, all that shit. I mean, when he puts on a show, he puts on a fucking show, and he he owns that screen for whenever he's whenever he's in it, except when Paul Newman comes in it, because Paul Newman's a fucking badass too. Well, but, interesting, interesting so, thing. Yeah. Apparently, Tom Cruise shot. Every shot in this movie, except for one. Oh, All really? The shots are him. Yes, the only shot that was not actually Tom Cruise was when he jumps the ball over the two balls and hits the ball behind it and knocks it into the pocket. Yeah. That's the only shot that they actually had a stunt pool player perform in it. And, and it's funny because that's the only shot that's slow motion and it's kind of a janky, yeah. weird-looking shot. It works perfectly in context, but I think they also did that to hide the fact that it wasn't Tom Cruise that was making that particular shot. It's expertly handled. But yeah, when you see all those pool shots, that's them doing that. The only reason Tom Cruise didn't make that shot was he didn't have time to learn that shot. <laughs> that's it. So if you want to talk about a guy that like really puts in his 110% when he gets a role, this is it. And you know, going back to range, I'm thinking, like, the first movie most people remember Tom Cruise in is Risky Business. But if you go back and watch Taps, when he's the one that, like, he's he's the weekend warrior that really, you know, he's been in military school all his life, and he really wants to actually open fire with a gun one time, and he finally does it. And that whole scene, he's only got a couple of scenes in that movie, but... It's so powerful. It's so convincing. It's so moving. It's it's that right there was the blueprint for everything that Tom Cruise was going to do after that, and it, because it really showed off that when he delivers a line, you really believe that it's not wasn't written for him. He's saying that. Yeah. Um. And, and then we get the vampire Lestat. So anybody that would claim that Tom Cruise doesn't have range hasn't watched enough Tom Cruise movies because he is all over the board. And and for a while, he kind of was getting shoehorned into doing the same role over and over again. But I'm going to go on the record and say right now, nobody else could have done Jerry Maguire. Nobody else could have done Vincent in The Color of Money. 
there's so many roles that he's done that he just completely owns. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, he's he's a Scientologist, and, and yeah, he's a bit of a weirdo, and yeah, he jumped up and down on, on Oprah's couch. Well, I don't uh, care. Oprah can buy, yeah, exactly. Exactly. I don't well, care. Can act. <laughs> the man acts like no one's business, and he's completely unappreciated, and it's a damn shame. So, any any other insights into the color of money? Oh, man. Um, not really. Just watch it. There's it's, no reason why you shouldn't watch this movie. And, um, again, don't be don't be put off by the fact that you think it's all about pools. It's that's just the vehicle for the story. Um, so yeah, watch that. Um, if uh, I recommend the Hustler too, is darker and grittier and slower. Then uh, The Color of Money, um, of course, you know, it's a 1960s film, you know, it's in black and white and, you know, and I mean, objectively in, in every way, The Color of Money is a superior movie, uh, but the story is still really good in The Hustler. Again, it's, it's very, it's really dark. Um, it takes a while to get into, but what, once you get into it, once he starts playing uh, Jackie Gleason, who's Minnesota Fast in that movie, it starts to pick up steam and it keeps going and keeps going and uh, very good film. Well, interesting note on that one. Um, they had offered Jackie Gleason a role and they had written actually a scene uh, or a couple of scenes with Jackie Gleason in it. And when they sent him the pages, he said it felt like it had been tacked on. So he turned the role down. He did not return as Minnesota Fats for this movie, um, but he was hey, invited. You know I, I, I think the movie's better for it. Because right. I, 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 I think... I think having reprised his role as Minnesota Fast would have would have taken away from the movie. Yeah, yeah. So, and and I mean, so really, the, the, really, the movie. I mean, it's really about at the end of the day, the movie's really about Paul Newman. Yeah. Um, and there's really no need to call too far back into the past into the previous movie. And I like the fact that they very only subtly hinted back at the Hustler and only a couple of times, and it, 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 and it's so subtle that you probably missed it. Yeah, they didn't feel the need to beat you over the head with the fact that this is a sequel. Yeah. But um, uh, uh, if you're a Scorsese fan, definitely check this out because uh, you're going to see, like, a lot of the pool shots is shot very similarly to uh, the boxing scenes in Raging Bull. But then you also get a lot of Scorsese's, you know, familiar tropes, like the really long one-take shots. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you're going to start seeing those pop up in here. Uh, the way his camera is spinning around the characters while other stuff is going on, you're going to see a lot of that. Yeah. Um, it's, it's a wonderfully crafted film. Um, I, I love the fact that they muted the color palette so that, like, in any given scene, the pool balls are almost always the brightest thing yeah. in the room. And that's, that's the kind of, that's a level of craft that very few directors really get to that level of nitty-gritty. A lot of times they're like, oh, yeah, just whatever the cinematographer says. He's a cinematographer. He knows what he's doing. Scorsese knows, you know, what's important in a shot and how to make even the, the little stuff really important in, in, a, in, a, in a visually interesting way. At no point does it ever feel borrowed. At no point does it ever feel like, like they, they ripped off something from a different or a better movie. Scorsese is really a one of a kind. And, and a lot of the stuff that, that you see in this film gets carried on even all the way up to like the Wolf of Wall Street. Mm -hmm. You know, he's still using a lot of these same techniques in the films that he's working on today. I guess I should say The Irishman, um, but uh, you know what? I, 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 I refuse to watch that movie. I tried watching like, I got like maybe maybe 10 minutes of that film, I had to turn it off. Um, it, has, it has nothing to do with Martin Scorsese. It has everything to do with the fact that I'm not buying um, Robert De Niro, is Robert De Niro and uh, Joe Pesci playing younger characters. No, no no, amount of CG anything can fix that shit. You should have casted younger actors to play those roles. You're, you're not wrong. I'm going to drop this bomb on you. Are you ready? Yeah. What? Tom Cruise, I believe, is the same age now that Paul Newman was when they filmed The Color of Money. Oh, wow. Paul Newman was 61 years old oh. when they did this film. So, actually, what I think would be fascinating would be if Martin Scorsese decided that he wanted to pick up The Color of Money and, and like, have Tom Cruise come back now that he's the same age as Paul Ooh. Newman. Ooh. 
pick up where Tom Cruise is going to school somebody on on the art of the hustle. But deal I with that different. I don't know if that would work though, because you don't really know. I mean, all you know about him, because Tom Cruise really doesn't have a great fall, or or you're paying a real price that uh, Paul Newman had to in the Hustler, because Paul Paul Newman loses everything in the Hustler until that that last uh, um, pool game with Minnesota Fast, and yeah. even then, even though he wins, he still loses because he's not he he can't play pool anymore. Yeah. Yeah, that I mean, that's why he's on a 25-year hiatus from pool, and that's the whole reason why you know we hear is you know Tom Cruise in the back with that sledgehammer break. Yeah, and watch this kid just being memorized, mesmerized. It's like that's what brought him back because he had been gone for 25 years because he wasn't allowed to play pool anymore. So much fertile ground, and and these are so richly developed characters. That there's 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 and, and again it's all in the details of this film. You know a lot more about Vince's character than just the fact that he's really good at pool. You know about <laughs> his family. You know about his life. You know about like you know where he comes from and and yeah. you know the fact that he can be taken in and you you see that change in his character. So to me it would be kind of fascinating if they you know went the opposite direction and that you know he got so obsessed with the game that he lost everything because Paul Newman starts off in the color of money and. He's a very well liked and well respected liquor salesman. Yeah. He, he does very well. You, you know, he's wearing it, he's driving it, he's this, he's that. Liquor money's been good to him. Yeah. It would be fascinating to see that Tom Cruise developed a gambling addiction. He lost everything. Carmen left him, blah, blah, blah. And he's trying to climb out of that. That, that could be good. That could be good. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, anyway. Last thing I want to start is give a couple recommendations for some uh, Paul Newman movies. Um, obviously, yeah, I watched The Hustler. Uh, cool Hand Luke's a good one. Uh, uh, Cat on a Hot Tin Roof with, yes. uh, uh, oh, what's her name? Uh, Elizabeth Taylor. Yes, Elizabeth Taylor. Woo! I, uh -huh. I, I, I get it now. When, you know, when I was growing up, I was like, I saw her when she was well past her prime. I was like, what? Really? Elizabeth Taylor? She was hot? Yeah, Elizabeth Taylor's yeah. hot. Yes, she was. <laughs> Uh, the Sting slap shot. Uh, I mean, you just, you know, the Sundance Kid is is a is a wonderful little movie. I I really do enjoy that one, and it's a product of its time. You can tell it's an early seventies film just because of the way it's paced and structured. But it is a damn fun movie. I have to admit, I, I enjoy that one quite a bit. My recommendations on this one, I mean, seriously, you you covered the Paul Newman stuff. I'm gonna say, you know what? If you enjoy this kind of movie, uh, I would say check out Rounders. Um, oh, yes. I think that is oh, a yeah. Matt Damon film that is underappreciated, but at the same time, it also shows, you know, here's the one that's, that's you know, two guys that are skilled at the game, one that's kind of scummy, one that's kind of trying to do it straight. And I, I've always enjoyed that film. So when I was watching this, I was kind of thinking, how much does Rounders owe to this? Because... It, it comes off this as the same kind of film that it is very much a character study of this. And I could go on, but but it's just kind of like this is one of those singular films that that just just watch this one. I, I know that this is one of those films that's kind of been lost to the sands of time a little bit. No one thinks back to 1987 and goes, "Oh yeah, the color of money." <laughs> this is totally worth seeing on on a lot of different levels, and and this is like. There, there's, like I said, this is the movie that really kicked off Martin Scorsese's big films, the films that he's now renowned for. So without this, you don't have Goodfellas, you don't have Casino, you don't have uh, uh, The Wolf of Wall Street. So go back to this, watch this, and thank your lucky stars that this film with this cast was this good. Yeah, yeah. Um, what are we watching Next. I'm so excited. What are we watching? What are we watching next? We are going back to our roots on this next one. And we are going to be watching the 1969 magnum opus sci-fi flick, The Green Slime. I was so sold on that trailer that you sent me, dude. Oh, it was magnificent. Magnificent. I hope, I hope that it holds up. I hope that it's every bit as shitty glorious or what what whatever i just, I just got feelings by watching that trailer that 
we're gonna have a good time, and then we're gonna have fun reviewing it. So I'm really That's excited true. for next week or I, I, the next I'm episode. I'm excited for next week. So I, I, that, and 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 that theme music. Mom! Yeah. Oh, oh, that's like enough to make me want to go buy the soundtrack, and I'm sure that that's the only song on it. <laughs> so, <laughs> right on. Well, we'll see you guys the uh, in the next episode. Peace.